going to read for us the passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, from verse 12, all the way to verse 34. If you are there, say amen. amen. Let's read God's word. Before we read, let's pray, and then we'll read and dive in. So this, we have just uh, confessed in that hymn, it's in you alone we start. We thank you for that reminder yesterday that the good news is about Jesus. We thank you that you reminded us that the gospel is good news of God's grace to us and deserving sinners. We pray for one another this morning. As we come to your word, would you please speak to us? Please, Lord, would you encourage each one of us in this room this morning that would listen to you and would hear from you for these things we ask in Jesus' name. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 12. The Bible says, <coughs> Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be mis misrepresenting God, because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who also have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all the people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. Verse 25, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is dead. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. But when it says all things are put in subjection, it's plain that he is accepted. Who put all things in subjection under him? When all things are subjected to him, then the son himself, will also be subjected to him, who put all things in subjection under him, that God may be all in all. Otherwise, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die every day. What do I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunkard stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. For some have knowledge of God. I say this to your shame, and this is the word of the Lord. No one likes to be a loser, isn't it? No one likes to be a loser. No one here would want to be known as a loser. That is, no one would like to be known here to have lost anything, including the games and the activities that we were doing yesterday. I was looking yesterday as we were doing those different games, and I was teasing the other teams who eventually lost. Though we did say that no one lost, because even those who were number three were top three, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was number three out of three groups, because no one likes to be a loser. We all want to be known as winners. Losing can sometimes be very hard. That's why when yesterday my team won, I was very excited to come and celebrate, even, even though I was not there the whole time helping them to win. Because no one wants to be known as a loser. 
Now, you might be wondering, what, what has Lucy no winning for that matter have to do with this passage before us this morning? The truth is, the passage that is before us here, that I've just read for us, has everything to do with you being a loser or you being a winner. Yes, these verses that have, uh, we have just read helps us to see that if one thing didn't happen, you and I are losers. And the big question that these verses here deal with today is about resurrection. And it seems, if you look with me there in verse 12, some people are wondering, will the dead be raised? Look down with me, verse 12. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? In other words, some people are wondering if resurrection, that is resurrection of the dead, will, be raised, will happen at all. Will the dead be raised? Will there be resurrection for us? Will you and I, we who have believed in the gospel, we who have believed in Jesus, be raised at the end? In fact, to put this differently, what happens when we die? What happens after death? Is death dead? Or will there be resurrection? for us. Will we be raised from the dead? Now, looking at what Paul says here in these verses that are before us, we see him tell us two important things. Yes, Paul highlights two very important truths that you and I ought to reflect on, to ponder on throughout this day. The first thing that Paul notes here is there in verse 12, all the way to verse 20, or to verse 19. And this is what Paul says. Without the resurrection, Christians are losers. Without the resurrection, believers are losers. That's the first thing that Paul says in these verses. Look down with me how he starts there in verse 12 all the way to verse 14. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, that, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. Do you see here how Paul notes that resurrection is a big deal for all of us Christians? He says that if there is no resurrection of the dead, then there is no Christianity. If you like, no resurrection, no Christianity. No resurrection, no Christianity. And this is big because if there is no resurrection, then the good news we saw yesterday doesn't exist. Verse 13. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And that really touches the heart of Christianity. If Christ was not raised, then what Paul preached was in vain. And what everyone believed was in vain. I hope you remember how yesterday in verse 1, Paul tells them that I preached to you good news, and it's that good news that you believed, it's that good news that you received. And one big thing about what Paul was preaching was that Christ was raised from the dead. But he tells them, if Christ was not raised from the dead, then what that means, you are losers. What, have, what you have believed in, what I was preaching in, and what you believed in is just a lie. Please look down with me, verse 15, and note what no resurrection means. Verse 15, look down with me. If the dead are not raised, Paul says that, then Paul is even found to be misrepresenting God because he testified about God that he raised Christ. This whole, about, uh, this whole thing about no resurrection really affects lots of things. If resurrection did not happen, and if believers will not be raised, then there is no hope for us. We are losers. Paul says, we are misrepresenting God who we say raised Christ from the dead. If the dead are not raised, Paul goes on to say there in verse 16, then not even Christ was raised if the dead are not raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then Christianity is a scum. 
If Christ was not raised from the dead, then Christianity is a joke. If Christ was not raised from the dead, then Christianity is all fake news. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then our believers who have fallen asleep, or if you write believers who have died, there is no hope for them. Paul says, death is dead. Once someone is taken six feet below, that's dead. What happens when we die? You die, if there is no resurrection, then that's dead. It's very important we read that Simkin, isn't it? If there is no resurrection, then all Christians are losers. If there is no resurrection, we are losers. And there is no hope for us. In fact, verse 19, Paul puts it even more clearly. Look down with me what he says there in verse 19. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. If there is no resurrection, then we are losers. If there is no resurrection, then you and I are to be most to be pitied. Sisi tunafaku kuhurumiwa sana. Kwa maana tumekuwa tukihubiri kuna ufua wa wafu. And there is nothing like that, Paul says. Then we must be pitied. We are most to be pitied. Or we have been believing a lie. But, look with me how verse 20 starts. But, but, verse 20. The word but there is a game changer. Look what Paul says there in verse 20. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. What Paul says here in verse 20 changes everything. Verse 20 affirms a fact. In fact, it affirms a historical fact. Christ has been raised from the dead. And if he has been raised from the dead, that changes everything. Which takes us to the second point that we see this morning. And the second thing is, since Jesus has been raised from the dead, then we too will be raised. Because Jesus has been raised from the dead. We too will be raised. Since Jesus Christ resurrected, we too will resurrect. I hope you see here from verse 20. I hope as I read verse 20, you're able to feel the change of tone. You know, what he has been doing from verses 12 to 19 is just to argue, you know, if Christ is not raised from the dead, then this or that will happen. Verse, verse 20, he says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. It's kind of what you call the last nail on the coffin. <laughs> if there is no resurrection, then Christians, we are losers. But Christ has been raised from the dead, which then means we are not losers. We are winners. Let me read. Verse 20 to 22. And just as I read this through, just look through and see whether you can be able to feel the change of tone. Sasa, verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Here yeah, in these verses, Paul makes it clear that since Christ was raised, many who have believed in him and have fallen asleep will too be raised. In fact, Paul goes on in verse 21 to say that death came through, death came through one man, Adam. And as just came through one man, Adam, so his life, so his resurrection. When Jesus died, we read this morning in our Bible studies about his resurrection, uh, his, his, his resurrection on the cross and how he died and what happened when he died. Indeed, he died. And we saw that in our Bible studies this morning. But the truth is, when he died on the cross, after three days on the Easter Sunday, he conquered death. He rose from the dead, never to die again. And if he rose from the dead never to die again, then what that means is he opened a way for you and for me. He opened a way for us to rise from the dead. 
No wonder Paul tells us, since Jesus resurrected, rose from the dead, we too will be raised from the dead. I guess most of us here in this room have experienced death of a loved one. Could be a close friend. Some of us could be a parent. Some of us could be either a brother or a sister or a cousin. Losing a loved one can be very hard at times. Losing a loved one is painful and difficult. Death is an enemy. In fact, Paul calls it the last enemy of God's people. When we lose a loved one, and I, I'm sure all of us here have attended the barrio, all of us in this room have attended the barrio. When we lose a loved one, it's very hard. And it's very hard because we know that on this side of life, we'll never see them again. They're gone for good. When they die, they're gone. They're away from us forever. And that can be very hard and difficult to process and to come to terms with. I personally, last year in April 10, lost my own mom. In fact, this Sunday would be exactly a year since my mom died. It's hard, difficult. I miss her. To be honest, sometimes I've been very hard. All that is left is just for memories of my mom. She went to be with the Lord, never to see her again on this side of life. <coughs> you see, when you lose a loved one, only one thing can comfort you. Resurrection. Without it, there is no hope. Without the resurrection of the dead, there is no hope even of ever myself meeting my mom and my dad. And for you, without resurrection, there is no hope of meeting your loved ones. But looking at what Paul says here, you and I can be comforted by the fact that since Jesus rose from the dead never to die again, we too will be raised from the dead never to die again. Since Jesus resurrected, we too will resurrect. Please note here that this is not just a hope. It's not just hope for the people Paul was writing to. It's hope for us, all of us here this morning, we who have trusted in Jesus, who conquered death for us. That when we die, and to die we will, we too will be raised from the dead. It is not dead. Six feet below is not dead. Death isn't dead of Christ, for Christians. And it's not be, and because it's not dead, just as Christ was raised, so shall we. If our loved ones had trusted in Jesus and believed in Jesus, if they were born again and put their faith in Jesus, then what this means is, even though they died, one day we will see them again. Because since Jesus resurrected, we too will resurrect. In fact, Someone puts it very helpfully. He said, we can be sure of our resurrection. We can be sure of rising from our graves. Then we are sure of waking up from our beds tomorrow morning. I'm sure most of us can't imagine this. Some of us think, oh, you know, we are in a, on a camp. Tomorrow morning, when we go to bed this night, we we'll wake up tomorrow morning. We are sure of that, isn't it? Most of us are. But someone said, for Christians... For those who have received the good news we were talking about yesterday, for those who have believed in Jesus as their personal savior, he conquered death for them. 
And then what that means is, we can be sure of raising from our graves on that last day when the trumpet will be blown. We can be sure of rising from the dead that we are sure of waking up tomorrow morning from our beds. And this is my point. Since Jesus resurrected, we too will resurrect. Jesus tasted death, that last enemy, as Paul calls, him, calls death here. He tasted it for us. And since he was raised from the dead, we too, we who, believe, we who will believe in Jesus today, throughout this camp, throughout this life, on this edge of life, we too will be raised from the dead. Now, before we bring this to a conclusion, it's good to ask ourselves one question. I think we asked the same question yesterday, we'll ask ourselves the same question tomorrow. So what? Now that we have already seen that without resurrection we are losers and there is no hope for us, and now that we have seen that because Jesus was raised from the dead, so shall we, the question is, how is this truth ought to affect the way we live now? In other words, how ought we to live and conduct ourselves in light of what we have seen, that if we have believed in Jesus, we'll be raised from the dead? What are we supposed to do? And how are we supposed to live now, brothers and sisters? Verse 34 gives us the answer. Look down with me in verse 34. Wake up from your drunkard stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning. Wake up from your drunken stupor as is right and do not go on sinning. Yes, in light of what we have seen in these verses, get this right. Wake up and stop sinning. In other words, sober up now and live for eternity. You see, brothers and sisters, the truth we have just seen about the resurrection ought to affect how we live right now. If there is no resurrection, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then we can say, like some people are saying there, or are reported to be saying there in verse 32. Please look down with me in verse 32. In fact, this ought to be funny. Look down with me in verse 32. What do I gain if humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us do what? Why? This ought to be funny. You know what people say? If there is no resurrection, if this is all we have got, if this life is all we have got, then watch out to enjoy Maisha. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. And if death is dead, then what's the point of not enjoying life now? If this is all we have got, then let's enjoy it while it lasts. If this life is all there is, then we can enjoy it, Kapisa, before our time to die comes. And soon it will. Wanda some waswahidi husema, hoda mali, kifo charger. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we do what? We die. If there is no resurrection, this is, <laughs> this is very serious. For non-Christians, because this life is all we have got, then there is no need for even right. There is no need for not enjoying Maisha. If there is no resurrection, then there is no need to follow what the Bible says. If there is no resurrection, then let's engage in all kinds of evil and immorality and addictions. Because this life is all we have got. Let's eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. We won't be here tomorrow. We will die. Just like our grandparents and great grandparents died. Why not enjoy life now? Since we are going to die soon. Let me tell you the truth. And this is the truth. A hundred years to come, no one in this room will be alive. Let that sink in. Most of us here, I think as someone was joking, will not see the next millennium. 
2200. Then what does that mean? We, we can join in. As Paul is quoting some people here saying, if there is no resurrection, if this is all we have got, then let's eat and drink because tomorrow we are going to die after all. But Paul saying here, for Christians, this can't be the case. For Christians, this can't be the case because he says here, for Christians, you can't say let's eat and drink because tomorrow we die. He tells us, wake up from your sleep, get this right, and do not go on sinning. Because if you sin, you lose eternity. Live for eternity now. Live in holiness. Live for God. Today, tomorrow, on the days to come. Live for God at home with your parents. Do what the Bible says. And sim simply what to sober up means, let no one deceive you that this life is all we have got. Because since Jesus resurrected from the dead, we too will be raised. What that means is, we can live for eternity now as born again Christians. We can live for Jesus now by serving him in our local churches. We can live for Jesus now by saying no to sexual sin. And saying no to that which doesn't please God. So the question for you and for me now is, how are we living in light of what is to come? Verse 35, 34. Wake up. Get this right. Do not go on sinning. Could you say your life is marked with a daily fight against sin? Are you living today in light of resurrection? That one day you will resurrect just as, just as Jesus resurrected? Or are you today engaging with that which displeases the Lord? May the Lord help us. May the Lord help us to live for him now, even as we long and look forward to spending days without head with him. For we know that because he was raised, because Jesus resurrected, then we too, we resurrect never to die again. Let's close our eyes. want us to, three of us in this room, to pray. And this is how I want us to pray. We are closing our eyes. Just think of that one thing that today's passage has struck you about. That one thing that we have seen could be these two points that we have seen from this passage. Could be that so hot, the answer for that so hot question. What I want us to do is, as many as... Uh, we are here. We'll start with our leaders who will help us, one or two of the leaders. And then most of us can just pray one sentence prayer, just praising God for the truths we have seen from 1 Corinthians 15.